One of the first targets for Operation Starburst was not the guns, but a group of cocaine smugglers operating between Jamaica and the St. Anne's estate. The gang was led by Linford Shepard and Carl Guthrie, who used female mules to bring cocaine into the city in bulk from the West Indies. Mr. Guthrie, who was jobless and lived on the St. Anne's estate, and Mr. Shepard had extensive links to Jamaica and were pouring millions of pounds worth of cocaine into the region. Operation Conduit was set up to target them, and within a few months, dealers working for them were being taken out. The base of the business pyramid was being chipped away at. By the time the team got to Mr. Guthrie and Mr. Shepard, they had taken out 62 of their foot soldiers and seized more than three million pounds worth of cocaine. One 29 year old smuggler, Sandra Cook, who lived in Snenton and worked as a cleaner at Nottingham Evening Post, had made a number of mule runs to and from Jamaica, but was also ripping off local dealers. In February 2004, she made another trip under the guise of visiting her sick mother in Montego Bay. She was met off the plane, driven to a sugarcane field and executed with one shot to the back of the head. Eventually, Mr. Shepard and Mr. Guthrie, having ran out of workers, were forced to get hands-on. Mr. Shepard, the senior of the two, used his son, Jonathan Levine, to ferry coke into the UK. He was caught and jailed for 10 years. On the 11th of January 2005, Pamela Fogo, a 51-year-old mother of three from St. Anne's, was met by Guthrie at the airport. She had already been searched once after the sniffer dogs marked her out, but custom officers had failed to find the call bag stitched into the inner lining of her rucksack, which contained uncooked cocaine worth £320,000. Officers from Operation Conduit, who knew she was carrying cocaine somewhere, followed the two as they took a taxi back to Nottingham, stopping the car on the A453 coming into the city. Miss Fogo received a six and a half year prison sentence for her mule work, and Mr. Guthrie received 10 years for conspiracy to supply Class A drugs. Mr. Shepard, who had by now assembled substantial wealth, including properties all over Jamaica, had received a five-year sentence. It was a successful operation by any standards. By now, the Starburst team was ready to take on the white gangs, starting first with the Dawes family. In January 2004, Nottinghamshire police arrested a young man on suspicion of burglary. Detective Sergeant Darren Mee began interviewing him at Oxclose Lane Police Station over a suspected break-in, but soon the youth, Peter Williams, stopped the interview and said he wanted to speak to a senior officer. He said he had some information about a murder which would interest them. The senior officer on duty, Detective Inspector Tony Webster, was called out to handle the matter. Gradually, a story began to emerge. I know something about the Marion Bates murder, Mr Williams told him. Those involved were Craig Moran, a lad called Betton or Breton, and another lad that I don't know. Craig had the car, which was a dinger, to use on the job. There was also a scooter. I think they brought that. The lad, I don't know his name, was the rider of the scooter and it's him that did the shooting. So how do you know all this, Peter? Mr. Webster asked the young man. I was there, the teenager told him. I went into the jewelers with the other lad and I forced the lock off the cupboard with the crowbar. And the next thing I heard was a shot. I didn't know he was gonna shoot anybody. And another thing, I also know who set the job up and where the gun came from. It was all a gunny's job, Colin Gunn. He said nobody would be shot. Peter Williams was charged with the robbery at the time center and the murder of Marion Bates. But crucially, D.I. Webster, who was working under a heavy load at the time, neglected to write up the notes in his pocketbook until two days after the event. A judge would later cite this as one reason for ruling Mr. Williams' confession inadmissible in a court of law. D.I. Webster, who also apparently was unaware at the time of the arrest of police intelligence logs, which stated that Mr. Williams was strongly suspected of involvement of the Marion Bates murder. It was later also discovered that Mr. Williams had been on an electronic tag and on the day of the killing should have been monitored by a private security company, Premier, but had removed his tag a week before after being released on license from Onley Young Offenders Institution three weeks earlier. He also missed seven out of the 11 scheduled meetings with Nottingham Youth Offending Team. This breach of bail conditions was not picked up by the company, which should have checked that Mr. Williams was at his home address and under curfew. Later, at the trial of Mr. Williams, Dean Betton and Craig Moran, D.I. Webster revealed his failings in an emotionally charged moment at Wolverhampton Crown Court. I don't think I've been good enough at my job, he admitted. 
I don't expect sympathy from anyone. I've let the Bates family down, the CPS down, and the barristers, he said. Mr. William did make those admissions. He did say that, but how I've recorded it wasn't correct. The gist of what he's saying was correct, but having considered it for months, I believe it was a vast error on my judgement on my part in going anywhere near him that night. In the last probably five or six years, I have suffered from ill health. It is not an excuse for this, but I don't think my judgement has been correct. I came here today very agitated and because I don't think I have done the right thing. I don't want to drag the force into any further dispute by trying to defend a position that I've looked at for a long time now and I think I cannot defend in court properly. Discussions took place before the trial commenced, including applications from the defence that could have succumbed any trial had they been accepted. However, the judge, Mr Justice Goldring, ruled that the trial should go ahead. Mr Williams was convicted and received a life sentence. Dean Betton, who was 24, and Craig Moran, who was 23, both received 14 years. D.I. Webster broke down completely shortly after giving his admissions and left the witness box in tears, with the judge declaring him unfit to give any more evidence. He subsequently suffered a breakdown and was off work for nine months, though he later returned to duty. An independent police complaints commission inquiry into the police investigation of Marion Bates' murder found that there was no evidence of any misconduct by Mr Webster or any of their officers involved, though it did say that there were lessons for Nottinghamshire force to learn in relation to the best practice with regards to the timely completion of pocket notebooks. Inspector Sam Wilson, Vice Chairman of Nottinghamshire Police Federation, pointed out that Mr Webster had been commended five times for his work and had an exemplary record. Tony is highly respected by his colleagues and has never lost his focus on what the job is about, catching criminals and protecting the public, he said. We are heartened he has been completely exonerated by the totally independent IPCC. Police had intelligence at the time that a car linked to the Bates robbery, a maroon Peugeot, had been pulled over three months before the raid when it was driven by Colin Gunn's common-law wife, Victoria Garfoot. And by February 2004, they had information about Mr Gunn sponsoring the raid. But it took until January 2005 for him to be arrested. Officers were rewarded with a few nuggets when they came to Mr Gunn's mother's home in Raymead Drive on the 7th of January 2005. Mr Gunn was not there, but his solicitor later made arrangements for him to attend the police station. As police carried out searches of the property, they discovered various pieces of torn paper which were clearly the remains of a fax document. The bundle of evidence was bagged up and then the relevant pieces removed by one of the senior officers who realised its significance and its need to ensure the corruption investigation. Operation Salt remained hidden from the rank and file officers. Forensic examinations of the paper found it had been sent by fax from Radford Road Police Station to Limey's Clove Store in Brittlesmith Gate in Nottingham. The piece of paper had fingerprints of Jason Grocock, manager of Mr Limey's on it, and the fingerprints of Colin Gunn. The connection between the two was a trainee detective, Charles Fletcher, who was based at Radford Road Police Station. In December of 2003, one of Colin Gunn's runners went on an unsanctioned cocaine run into Lincolnshire. Mr Gunn found out about it and began to suspect the runner might be a weak link in the organisation. A bullet was fired through a letterbox of his home. Patrick Marshall, who was known as Celtic Pat because of his passion for the Scottish football team, had become a loose cannon as far as Mr Gunn was concerned and needed sorting out. Mr Gunn also heard Mr Marshall was trying to get a gun to settle the dispute with another man called Scotch Al and had decided to intervene in the situation. He sought out his deadliest gunman, John McSally, to deal with the situation. A junior member of the cartel organised the car, while Mr McSally told Mr Marshall he would be able to provide him with a gun. A meeting was arranged in the car park of the Park Tavern in Basford for around 8 o'clock on the 8th of February 2004. Mr McSally was late and Mr Marshall was on the point of giving up and going home when a ponytailed enforcer turned up. As the father of one walked up to Mr McSally to find out where the gun was going to be stored, Mr McSally shot him in the head. He then made his escape in a getaway car, careering through a bollard as he made his way out the pub car park. Patrick Marshall, 46, lay dying with a bullet wound to his head. John McSally was born in Nottingham in 1956. 
His criminal career began when he was 11 and his first spell in custody came in 1971 when he went to Borsal for burglary. In 2002, he was jailed after visiting Nottingham pubs with a shotgun, searching for a person he wanted to kill. He received a ridiculously short sentence of two and a half years for making threats to kill, possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and breaching a suspended sentence. The wild looking man with tattoos on his neck and a greying goatee his weakness for the penchants of getting drunk and letting his loose tongue wag. During boozy late night chats, he even told the landlady of his local pub in Fastford about some of the shootings he had carried out, saying he had been sexually aroused by it. Yeah, I did the Mansfield one, referring to David Draycott, and Patrick Marshall, and the black guy from the Heathfield estate. It's just business, he said. The black guy from the Heathfield estate was Derek Senior. A social worker. In September 2003, he and a friend arranged to meet a colleague in the pub. They went to the wrong one and ended up in the Lord Nelson in Bullwell by mistake. The dreadlocked Mr. Senior was chatting to his friend Esther Robinson when one of five white young white men playing pool kicked her buttocks while he was walking past the table. Derek asked them to apologise, but instead they grabbed him by his dreadlocks and dragged him into the corner of the pub where they began to kick punch and beat him with their pool cues. He suffered a fractured eye socket, a rib, and Esther suffered bruises after being attacked when she went to his aid. His attackers even danced around the pub, laughing and joking, holding his dreadlocks in the air. The incident, which happened just after 10pm, was caught on CCTV. Five men were all members of the Bestwood Cartel. They had been out celebrating a birthday and also the arrest of Michael O'Brien for the murder of Marvin Bradshaw. The men were 20-year-old James Brody, a young man who had just carried out a series of robberies. John McNee, who was 24, who had a history of violence in virtually every pub he'd ever been into. Joseph Graham, who was also 23. Lee Marshall, who was 24. And Robert Watson, who was 25, whose birthday it was. By the time the case came to court in May 2004, Mr. Brody had disappeared. He was wanted in connection for the shooting of Marion Bates. One of the Bestwood cartel contacted a drugs worker they knew and asked him if he would approach Mr. Senior and offer him some money to withdraw his complaint but the 50 year old had already given police a witness statement. Colin Gunn wasn't happy that his crew would have to face court, particularly as an incident would spark more questions about what had happened to James Brody. Mr. Senior, who had started growing his dreadlocks 33 years earlier, told police, it was the greatest insult I could ever suffer. I am a Rastafarian. It encompasses my life and religion. I have been deeply affected more than you can possibly imagine. The physical scars and injuries have healed, but the mental scars are likely to never heal. His attackers received sentences between six and a half years and two and a half years at Nottingham Crown Court on the 14th of May 2004. Three days later, Derek Senior was feeling more vulnerable than ever. He knew how these people might react, having gone to court and seen them sentenced. He had taken to driving his car to the shops, even though it was just down the road from his house. As he got into his car that evening, he didn't take much notice to the motorcycle revving up nearby. It just looked like a pizza delivery man. He had a cardboard box in his hand. He didn't see another man with a motorcycle helmet get off the bike and approach his car. John McSally thrust his handgun through the car window and pumped three bullets into Mr. Senior, shouting, you grassing bastard. Mr. Senior sat in his car with his hand still on the steering wheel trying to play dead as he battled to stay calm with the bullet wounds in his legs and his armpit. He later told a courtroom, I was trying to play possum, play dead as it were. Then, I got up, I hit the horn and I screamed, I've been shot. Derek Senior survived but was forced to enter the witness protection program. He has not been back to Nottingham since.